This is Crab's Journal 10, uh, or Chapter 10, from Crab by William Bell. She had large gray eyes, full lips that were a little dry and cracked, and long sandy-colored hair. Thinking I was still dreaming, I closed my eyes again. Come on, try to sit up, said a human voice above me. Come on. Arms gripped me from behind and lifted me until I sat unsteadily. I rubbed my eyes and tried to hold them open. Bright sunlight made it difficult, shooting little arrows of pain into my eyeballs. Finally, they focused on a woman, a tall, slender woman dressed in a red checked flannel shirt and jeans. She knelt in front of me and offered me a cup. Here, drink. I obeyed, still stupefied. I felt like I'd been asleep for a long time and I was completely disoriented. I drank down the delicious warm soup. The more I swallowed, the hungrier I got. Having drained the cup, I handed it back to her. She took it with rough calloused hands and short nails and a little dirty. The nails short and a little dirty. Do you feel warm now, she said, a little like an interrogator in her tone of voice. Yeah, I guess so. Well, think, do you or don't you? Yes, yes, I'm warm. Good. Count from one to ten. What? Just do it, she commanded. Her voice was firm, but not nasty. No cream puff, that's for sure. I counted, feeling a little silly. Okay, that's good. Her tone softened a little. Now, give me your name and where you're from. I must have been fully to my senses then, because I balked at that one. No, I don't want to do that, I said. Why? Just because I don't want you to know. I could make something up. She smiled and said, you too, eh? Well, that's okay. I just wanted to make sure your mind is working right. Hypothermia disorients the mind somewhat. You appear to be all right, though. <clears throat> What's hypothermia? She sat back and crossed her long legs, Indian style, and rested her hands on her knees. When you went over the falls, you almost drowned. The water in the river is very cold, and when I pulled you out, you were already in shock. That's what hypothermia is, really. Shock caused by cold, which lowers your body temperature. Eventually, it will kill you. Disorientation of the mind is one of the symptoms. Oh, I said weakly, and she smiled. Sorry, didn't mean to lecture you. Want more soup? Yes, please, I'm awfully thirsty. She got up and walked over to where a blackened pot sat balanced on a ring of rocks around a little smokeless fire. What had she meant by saying, you too, eh, I wondered. She came back with more soup and handed me the cup. Thanks, I said. This is good. What's in it? Oh, let's see. She folded her long legs under her and sat down again. Mmm, fish heads, flour, and some pork, lily root, and onion. You might think I'd throw up at that description, but that was the best soup I ever tasted. I was famished. It was hot, savory, full of ch tasty chunks of potato tasting stuff. How did you find me, I asked. I don't remember anything after I went over. <clears throat> I had to shift my weight because I began to notice a pain in my chest now that I was fully awake. Putting my hand to my ribs, I saw my left arm was bandaged from elbow to hand and splintered with two round peeled sticks. Funny, as soon as I saw the dressing, which was bright blue flowery cloth, my arm began to throb. Careful, she warned. You've got a couple of cracked ribs. I've bound your chest. That's why it's hard to get a deep breath. Is it very sore? I nodded. Your arm was cut pretty badly, and it might have been broken, but I'm not sure. I splinted it just in case. To answer your question, I saw you go over the falls. I was downriver a bit, putting out some night lines, and I looked up just in time to see you disappear into the water. I thought you'd be dead by the time I got to you. It took me a while to fish you out of there, but everything seemed to have worked out okay. I think you'd better go back to sleep now. You've had a near miss, and you need lots of rest, but I... I wanted to thank her and say something. We can talk later. There's lots of time. I didn't argue because I could hardly keep my eyes open and I felt weak. She handed her, I, So I handed her the empty cup and I lay back and blanked out immediately. When I woke again, I was lying on my back. I imagined I saw a great blood-colored bird descending on me and it terrified me until I realized I was looking up at the nylon fly that moved slowly, billowing uh, and was rhythmically lifted rhythmically by the cool wind. I relaxed. My ribs and arm hurt slightly, like an engine throbbing in the background. I could hear the wind whistling on the trees around the campsite, and every once in a while, a, cracked, a crack or pop from a fire that glowed a dozen or so yards away. Soon I became aware of breathing near me, and I realized the woman was asleep right beside me. I looked at her. She faced away from me, curled up. She was fully dressed, boots and all, and had a hat on, one of those knitted toques your mother tries to get you to wear. She slept like that, I assumed, because I was in her sleeping bag. Who was she, I wondered, and what the hell was this beautiful woman doing, way the hell and gone in the middle of nowhere? Was she alone? It seemed so. <clears throat> she knew what she was doing, unlike me out here. One look at the campsite told me that. She could find and cook wild food. She knew first aid, did a really professional-looking job of fixing me up, and that face, a face that beautiful, you'd think, belonged in a classy drawing room or on the screen. I looked at the thick hair that spilled from beneath her hat and thought that truth is stranger than fiction. There lay Crab, naked in a sleeping bag in the middle of nowhere, right beside a very attractive woman. Did I create fantasies from those ingredients? No. I rolled over, facing that friendly, comforting fire, and fell asleep. 
The smell of the fire aroused me to a morning already drenched in sunshine. I sat up in the bag with difficulty, yawned, and stretched as much as my ribs and sore arm would allow. She was at the fire, frying something that sizzled deliciously and smelled the same. Her back was to me. Beyond her, a snowy mist hid the water and skirted the edge of the forest. A beautiful scene, peaceful, with no traffic honks and screeches, no mother screaming at you to get out of bed. She turned and spoke in a voice that seemed to fit the scene. How do you feel this morning? Fine, I guess. Still sore. Do you want to try and get up then? Not until I get up my clothes. She laughed and pulled my togs from a line she had strung between two birch saplings. I got most of the blood out, she said, and she tossed them to me. I dressed quickly, finding my boots beside the fire. They were dry and toasty. I felt a bit wobbly when I walked, but otherwise my body seemed in decent repair. <clears throat> You're just in time for, for grub, she said, and handed me a tin plate. There was two small fish, fried golden brown, and a chunk of bread that gave off a hot, sweet odor that set my juices going. It was all delicious, washed down with strong, hot tea. Strange tasting, but good. Later I found out it was Labrador tea she picked herself and dried. We ate in silence. When I put down my plate and gulped the last of my second cup of tea, she ordered, Let's see that arm. I held it out to her while she untied the bright cloth strips that held the splints in place. Then she asked me to move my arm around and twist my wrist and so on. It hurt, but not badly. Good, she pronounced. Not broken. I couldn't tell for sure when you were unconscious. She changed the dressing on the wound, an ugly slash across my forearm, two or three inches above my wrist. She poured two more cups of tea from the blackened tin that served as her teapot. We sat there for a while saying nothing, captured by the strange peacefulness of the fire birdsong and the wavelets on the shore a small world under the huge blue dome of the perfect sky the mist had been burned into burned off by the morning sun leaving the air clear and still i looked around the tidy homey campsite something i couldn't quite put my finger on struck me about this place the two-person tent clotheslines chopped block chopping block a little lean-to with gear in it were arranged in a wide semicircle around the fireplace that was made up of the ring of stones that i took to be a sort of of an affair, also made of stones. We were about twenty yards from the water on a piece of land that rose gently from the bay, a sort of meadow fifty yards deep and thirty wide, carved out of the forest behind the sparsely treed and sparsely treed with young white birch and spruce. There was a patch of sandy beach at the water's edge, but most of the shoreline was a flat granite slab. The campsite was on the little bay, edged with grasses, almost closed off from the main part of the lake that could be glimpsed through the two granite arms clothed with jump juniper scrub. Then I saw it. This place would be impossible to find from the main lake. March grass grew across the gap at this time of year, of course. What I saw was the dead stuff from last year, and in the middle of summer it would be much thicker. The bay was like a secret harbor. Coincidence? Or had this strange, skillful woman chosen it for a reason? Now suppose you tell me how it came that you were taught that you tried to shoot trout falls in a canoe backwards. Her words jarred me from my speculations. I'd felt nothing for a minute, torn between the fear of letting my secret out and a sense of obligation to her. The peacefulness of the setting made me feel secure for some reason. I figured, in the end, that I owed her an explanation. She did save my life, after all. But I wouldn't tell her everything. I started my narrative at Ithaca Camp, and I left out my name. The more I talked, the more unbelieving she looked. Occasionally, she'd ask me a question and shake her head at the reply, but mostly she just let me talk. She was amazed that I took off without really knowing where I was going and was totally shocked to learn that I couldn't read a map or use a compass. It's already clear, she said, stabbing at me, that you can't paddle a canoe. I went on. I got a little miffed when she laughed about the bear attack. I left out some of the results. What's so goddamn funny? I asked angrily. I almost got killed. Oh, <laughs> I doubt that. The bear was rolling you around. It was curious to see if you had some more food, or if you were food, she giggled this time. Giggled, for God's sake. If that old Bruin wanted to hurt you, you'd be a mass of claw marks now. You were smart to roll into a ball and lie still. <laughs> I'm not sm I wasn't smart at all. I was terrified, and then I fainted. Yes, I know. It must have been horrible. <clears throat> I searched her face to, she was she to see if she was making fun of me. Her eyes were serious and sympathetic. But you asked for it, she said. What the hell do you mean? I shot back, not satisfied with her sympathy. Well, look, it's spring. Bears have been out of hibernation for only a few weeks, and they're hungry. And it's around mating season, and also, so they're also bitchy. And the ones in that neighborhood are well used to humans. What do you do? Throw peanuts around, spill fish oil all over yourself, and leave candies in your tent. You invited every bear within miles to check you out. All you needed was a sign and an ad on TV. She laughed again, and so did I. It was pretty stupid of me, come to think of it. Then she stood up. Well, enough of this merriment. I've got to check the night lines. What are they? I asked. It's a way of fishing without being there. Can I come? Although I still felt weak and not really up to going anywhere, I didn't feel like being alone either. 
If you like, she said casually. She started walking toward the water. There was a little corpse of black spruce right at the shore of the, to the left of the beach, and from it she lifted a 16-foot cedar strip canoe and placed it in the water. Near as you please. Need as you please. This was no weak woman, I tell you. She handed me a paddle. Put this at your feet. Don't try to paddle. You're too weak. In you get. In I got, and she stowed me. How, she showed me how to do so properly. She shoved off, and we headed out of the bay, across the open water, even through the marsh grass at the gap. Once out, I turned and looked back toward the campsite. I'd been right. The place was invisible. We were in a decent-sized lake, and to the left of us, a river, called the North, entered it. We moved up river, past the dense spruce forest that marched right to the shore. The deep water reflected the flawless sky, and I'll tell you, that woman could handle a canoe. After 20 minutes of swift, straight progress, she got into strong. we got into strong current. The water got shallower, and occasionally, a menacing boulder stuck a finger into the air. But she just took that boat exactly where she wanted to go. The roaring of trout falls came upon us as suddenly as we rounded a bend. We moved slowly now, but steadily, and finally entered a small pool at the foot of the cascading water. She maneuvered us toward a little sand beach, where the powerful current backed up on itself and left a calm spot with me in one arm me with one arm pulled the boat up onto the sand the falls was about 20 yards across the turbulent pool and about eight yards high don't get me wrong i'm not saying it was niagara falls or anything it was quite narrow because of those big boulders at the top that squeezed the water thin but it's hard to describe the feeling of naked power and energy it conveyed as the tons of water leapt to crash in a boiling rage into the black boulders scattered around the base the woman said that the pool was incredibly deep and a vicious tangle of opposing currents. She showed me where she'd pulled me out and pointed to what was left of my canoe, a shapeless mass of smashed red fiberglass jammed between two boulders around which angry water boiled and churned. The packs were at the bottom of the pool somewhere. I'll tell you, I stared at that scene with my mouth hanging open for a long time. How on earth had I survived that? I asked her how she had fished me out. Very matter-of-factly, no bragging, like she was writing a newspaper report, she pointed here and there describing the events, how she'd got me out, carried me to this beach, taken me home. It's a good thing the current is strong, she said. It pushed you to a relatively quiet spot of water where I was able to get you out. I thought about it hard while she told it. I tried to picture the whole thing. She must be incredibly strong, tough, and brave, I thought. She risked her life for me. She brought me back into the world. I stared at her in awe. Don't look at me like that, she said, embarrassed, I guess. It's no big deal. You'd have done the same for someone else. And then she handed, she headed towards the night lines. No, I wouldn't, I said to myself. I wouldn't have done that for anybody. I followed her, ashamed. And that is the end of the chapter.